Hey everybody, it's Triple L coming in to talk about My Hero Academia Chapter 275. You cheated. Uh, so first off, in general notes, super exciting chapter. I really love the choreography. I'm just looking here. I got like five pages of notes here, so it'll be a fun chapter to talk about. Uh, let's see other things. I do think it's funny that uh, back when Izuku showed up in one chapter, like they were just pushed away for one chapter and like within the same chapter. You have Gran Torino leaving them and then you have them showing up again at the at the end of the page. That, that was really funny, uh, but I really understand it. It's like the author needed a situation. Um, he needed to get a situation where Aizawa needed help, so I understand. Uh, let's see, any other things? We saw that Ryukyu's group survived. There's that. Like, that's cool that everyone survived from th that whole group. Uh, but yeah, overall, a fun chapter. Oh, you know what, guys? Something really cool is that Shueisha tried to copyright strike me for one of the chapter impression videos, but YouTube said no. Kinda. It was actually really surprising. YouTube has never done that. This is my first time ever actually seeing what Shueisha had said I had done wrong. Um, so that's really cool. It's cool to know that they can't copyright a string of words that give a meaning to a sentence. And you know, some of it, it's cool. It's cool. It makes me feel better. It makes me feel like this is um, this is good to do. Uh, yeah. Uh, so moving away from that, any other things to note? Um, oh, I got a, another general note here. Uh, there's a lot of moving around in the chapter. I found. Um, especially with the map being brought in. Um, and looking at a chapter, I really don't know if the distances are reasonable and just what's going on here. But I'm honestly not going to nitpick. It really feels like the author was just, you know, trying to move things along, trying to get this sorted in as little pages as possible, uh, trying to get all the things set up for the people arriving. Um, so I'm not going to nitpick. It's a really chaotic scene. And honestly, things will just work out the way that the author needs it. But there are a few spots where it's like, is that even possible in terms of them being able to see this thing or like there's this particular detail in the background? Is that possible? Uh, but it, again, when you're when you're in a point where you just got to get the fight going, um, things like spatial consistency, I think, will be sacrificed. And at that point, it just becomes a subjective thing. Anyway, let's just jump into it. My, my voice is going to die. Uh, so page one was just a progress report, pretty much. Just reminding readers where we are, nothing super important. Uh, we do have fun trivia, though, if you'll allow me to share it with you. It's specifically from the guy missing the horn. So you'll know this trivia if you've already seen uh, one of the older volumes. But here is the page we got. For those that didn't know, that guy without the horn, he is Miyagi uh, Daikaku. He always provides accurate, easy to grasp commentary on modern society from a fair and balanced perspective. Uh, his quirk big horn often ends up interfering with news footage or flip camera angles for that reason in order to make it easier to rely or to relay the news he resorts to slicing off one of his proud horns never one to rest on his laurels his stance of always putting his audience before his own body has simultaneously review, uh, received both society's praises on one hand and on the other very intense bashing from certain human rights group who state that he's denying his quirk uh, so really just goes to show you how much effort the uh, author puts in um, in that same page where he revealed that particular character He mentioned that he likes to think about the lives of his side characters or like, you know, just their brief backstory So it's just really neat to have this it, It's really neat, right? It's really neat to just remember um, All the people that come together in the story to make uh, one cohesive whole and you know like really you're never going to find out anything about this guy you're never going to know why he had a, cu a cut off horn in story so it's kind of nice that the author had put this in his uh, volume extras um one reason that i just wanted to bring him up though is just because uh his situation kind of just talks about the nuance that's kind of required uh when we're talking about the heroes and the villains let me see if i could just spot what he had written for this guy here Despite criticism, he continues to appear on TV to deliver news every day. After all, the quirks of this world so filled the quirks of this world so filled to the brim with superpowers aren't limited to heroes as all sorts of occupations fight their daily battles. There's no such thing as something absolutely everyone can agree to. That's why you can't help but look forward and keep walking in the path you believe in. I think that's a I think that's a nice sentiment. Um, this character is ultimately a character that stands as a guy who understands that he's not going to get everyone to agree with him, but he still does the best he can. Um, and it just speaks again to like how everything that someone does can be seen as either bad or good, depending on the perspective that you stand on. And then, you know, naturally from there, we get villain apologists. 
anyway, that fun little jab aside, uh, we go into page two and three. So page two, we have the news person mentioning that this is a terrorist attack. And I just want to say again for the villain apologist, the Paranormal Liberation Front that's their end game. They do want to blow stuff up and set Shigaraki up in the chaos that ensues as the leader. So they are invokers of terror. I have no problem with them um, continuing using the terrorist angle here. Um, I'm sure that no one else would have a problem with that either. But I've seen a lot of weird stuff on Tumblr that really makes me lose faith in how people interpret this stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, actually... You know, I say that, but I know what's going on. Like the whole phenomena of one person as a tragedy, a million is statistic, that mindset. People aren't good at, at processing things at scale unless they have a personal point of reference. So when you have villains giving their sob stories, because the characters seem so familiar, uh, maybe some people just end up relating and they're much more willing to apply uh, critical thought to the character and not apply that critical thought to people that they don't even know exist in the terms of the story. In regards to here academia, what it just ends up happening is that people just become much more sentimental or, and are much more willing to excuse the villains because they feel they have more familiarity with the villains. Anyway, I just bring that whole thing up uh, because on page three, we have the family page that just really serves to remind us uh, what exactly is at risk here? You know, the peace, the smiles, the people that are recovering. You know, all those things are kind of at stake when you have this fight going on in the background. Anyway, going back to page two, page two showed us an empty UA uh, staff room. Kind of eerie to see it there. And, you know, we see uh, All Might and Eddie here sitting together. And I, I think it's really brave to have a child that at one point forgot how to smile watching a scene of carnage. Like, if she doesn't get night terrors from that, I'd be really, really surprised. But it's Shonen Jump, reasonable depictions of care for children. Why Why should we even expect it in a battle shonen? We don't expect that. Come on. This is the magazine that uh, glorifies kids being child soldiers. So, you know, like, why, why even go there? Anyway, point of discussion on page three, though. I did find it interesting that... Uh, the Todoroki family gets so many panels in that little bit there. It just really reminds you that the Todoroki family is the most principal family. And when I see the three of them there, it just reinforces to me that they might still have drama coming their way. You know, like that theory just like it builds steam within me. And it, and it, it builds steam in the same way that for Yumi showing up in chapter 246 and 247 when she had no reason to be there indicated that we were going to get a mini plot. And, you know, we ended up getting the whole thing with ending. And also, I think it's funny that we know more about the girl that Natsuo is dating, and we don't know about Izuku's dad. Can you think about that? Can you think about how ridiculous of a situation that is? Uh, I mean, like, it's funny. But you know what? In all fairness, if Izuku's dad is all for one, then, you know, we have him on the page as well, which is also still very funny if that was the case. It's just funny when you step back and you look at the whole scene there. Any hoosers, another point. Uh, we got to see Bakugo's mom. Love seeing her. She looks like she's looking through a book of Bakugo growing up. Um, so that's kind of ominous in its own little way. Uh, we see that Ray is tending to a flower. So Endeavor probably brought her a flower at some point. And we see that All for One is smiling. Which um, to me that kind of says that he knows that Shigaraki is alive. And that uh, he is inside of Shigaraki now. I that, That's what that seems like to me. Anyway, just going back to the choicing of putting the Todorokis in, in all those panels. You know, I want to read into it. Because, you know, that's the fun thing to do. But really, the simplest answer for why this is happening, the main characters for the fight are Todoroki, Bakugo, and Izuku. Uh, so you show the people that are linked to them. That's just that's, that's just the simplest thing. On page 4, we get a status update page. No text, so nothing to look at there. Page 5, we have a page that sets things up for the rest of the chapter, with Shigaraki calling in the Nomu and the uh, Kido teamwork. So Kido in particular sets up a theme that the author uh, uses for the rest of the chapter, that being, te that being teamwork. We see it here, we see it with Manuel helping Aizawa, and we have Gran Torino ultimately betting on teamwork being the thing that will try and defeat Shigaraki. But something really important to note here is that Kido clearly has synergy with Endeavor and clearly knows how to accentuate Endeavor's strengths. So this was a really good depiction of the value of sidekicks, but keep this page in mind for later. On page 6 and 7, we have Manuel using his quirk and the author taking the time to tell the reader why exactly Aizawa used the quirk when he was out in the open and not hiding. So that was very appreciated. I do think it's unfair that Shigaraki has the eyesight to spot Aizawa, especially when he was like a smudge. But still, thanks for the author for adding those lines in. Um, one thing with this page, though, is that Manuel reminds us that every little thing helps. So props on him for being useful. Like, Ida is blessed to have the guy in his life. Honestly, like, he seems like a pretty cool bro. 
page seven, we have Endeavor using his attack. Page eight and nine, we get confirmation Shigaraki was in fact Hulk jumping by the strength of his own modified muscles. Now, all I gotta say is that in a better world, the Quirkless could just choose to scientifically enhance themselves. I mean, like, it just gives them so many options. If the doctor was a better guy, he could have just been giving out like free surgeries to everyone that wanted to get stronger. Like that would have been cool. Any hoosers, let's take a close look at page eight um, on Shigaraki's arm. So first off, it looks to me like Shigaraki used air pressure to push himself away and thankfully Endeavor confirmed that. So I think that puts him like at least, at least bare minimum above 20% Izuku, right? Or 20% one for all stockpile. Looking closer at his arm, what exactly is going on here? Because this looks pretty weird. Like, why does it look so rocky? So, like, are his muscles flexing so hard that they're as hard as mountains? Is that what's going on? Like, when we look at Gigantomachia, are Gigantomachia's back muscles at full 100% flex? Is that why they're so rocky looking? Um, Like, I don't know, man. It's weird. It's really weird to see... The kind of strange protrusion. I don't know if it's an art style or if it's like actually just his muscles flexing. It's just odd. What do you guys think? Um, and then at the bottom of that page, we have the doctor speaking and telling us that he's not as strong as All Might, which is great. Um, that gives us enough reason to expect Izuku to be able to tangle with him reasonably. On page 9, we have Aizawa justifying that uh, Shigaraki is like the first Nomu. And last time, you know, we were looking at the pages from that chapter just to remind ourselves of what we could have expected from Shigaraki. Now, there is something interesting here with the hurt leg that Aizawa had. I think we can now confidently say that there's an error. And I think the error is this panel in particular. In this panel, it's the left leg that's hurt as opposed to the proper right leg. I think it's pretty obvious in this panel also that Aizawa is facing forward. So, all things considered, I think what happened was... Given that the panel doesn't have many details, this might have been one of the panels that were was done last as the author got closer to the deadline. In other words, all you really need is for the studio to be in a kind of rush for this thing, for this kind of mistake to just happen. But uh, I do think we can just say, well, this is just one of the errors. At the bottom of the page, we have Shigaraki blasting the two p heroes out of the sky. And all I can really say is, like, can you believe how funny it is that the recently awake Shigaraki, of all things, has more maneuverability than a hero with wings? Can you believe how crazy it is that just moments after waking up, Shigaraki has such control of his body that he can maneuver in the air well enough to punch Endeavor into Ryukyu without missing? If Shigaraki got one for all, he'd, he'd probably be like All Might. Like a guy that just understands, he just gets it like a snap how to use the new power that he got as opposed to the Izuku type who had to slap training wheels onto himself. It's just really funny. And it's again funny that this is just done with physical enhancement. Honestly, if you have scientific modifications, like why even bother getting multiple quirks? All for one could have just taken over Japan with just an army of bargain bin Saitamas or, you know, bargain bin one punch mans if you don't know the show. If All Might was able to get to the top, that also says that brute strength will usually trump over all else. And I know you're going to bring up things like instant killers like Shizaki, yet, you know, when you look at Shizaki, he got wiped out by brute strength as well. So the reality just is when it comes to Hero Academia, brute strength is just too good to not have. Like if you have the option to have brute strength along with something else, yeah, you, you take the brute strength. It gives you too many options to deal with the quirk, the quirky world that people live in. It just seems like there's not an, I, I, I feel like in trying to make All Might so amazing, it created the side effect that there's just not that many ways of dealing with brute strength. So page 10, we have Gran Torino quickly explaining what's going on. And this is where we get a map of the situation. Like I said at the beginning, the relative distances here are kind of what throw me off as we move forward into the chapter. But like, again, like whatever, it's, it's a chaotic situation. I appreciate the map, though, just to give us a good sense of what exactly was going on in terms of like just rough approximations. On page 11, the most valuable things that we got, you know, were Grand Trina pointing out that there were risks involved and him filling in the kids. Um, he then goes on to say that they're up against one guy and makes a point about hero society. I think a fundamental mistake is being made here when Gran Torino says that. Gran Torino is focusing on the numbers but not taking into consideration the trappings that come along with those numbers. I like one, it doesn't matter that Shigaraki is one person because he has the value of multiple people. At the end of the day, Izuku, Suyu, and Mineta kids who didn't know any better were able to neutralize an entire squadron of aquatic villains and from when i counted there were like nine people that those three were able to put in check so you consider that and it's just like you have to remind yourself numbers don't matter in here academia 
Shigaraki right now is neutralizing Endeavor and Ryukyu with pure physical strength. Gran Torino is overlooking that the amount of heroes around isn't what's significant. It's the degree of functionality that the heroes contribute to the situation. And furthermore, I think a really good way of describing this is that heroes teaming up is essentially additive, but Shigaraki having multiple quirks, that's something that multiplies. So instead of 5 plus 5, you have 5 times 5. Shigaraki just has an innate advantage that comes from him being able to use multiple quirks because he can just coordinate with himself. Uh, when it comes to the others teaming up, you know, they don't have that advantage. Like the coordination may be where the weaknesses start. And that brings me to uh, the next point. It doesn't matter if Hero Society is saturated if they're not getting quality training that takes advantage of the fact that they're saturated. And what I mean by that is that there's a limit to how helpful multiple heroes can be when they're on one target. And the reason can be built from what we saw with Kido. It took one word from Endeavor for Kido to know what to do. That's because those guys are used to working together. Kido is primed to be able to help Endeavor. It's unreasonable to expect other heroes who may never have worked together in the past to be able to work perfectly together now. Especially with the group coming in here, like all of a sudden, it's just the people who are able to show up, you know, so ultimately, like, is it reasonable for Endeavor to know all the ins and outs of all the people who are about to arrive to help in the fight? No. Is it reasonable for the other heroes to know enough about the top heroes so they know how to work around them and not get in the way? Yes. But it's all, but that dichotomy is still going to play a factor here. Point is, in a way, I think it's really good that the Nomu showed up because that limits the confusion that would most likely occur if you have multiple quirk effects happening around the same person. You don't get to just magically work at 100% efficiency, right? Just by the virtue that there's a lot of you. That's just not how that works. Thankfully, Hero Academia Society is working, is going towards more uh, working together. Uh, but in this situation, like they're not at the point where you can actually expect a bunch of people showing up to be that much of a boon to the situation. Again, it goes to the quality of the person. If it's a high quality hero, then they're going to make it work. But if it's just a, a ragtag bunch, desperate, dangerous stuff, man. So page 12 to 13, we arrive with the Nomu. Here I went back to a previous chapter to see if any of the designs were reused, and I'll show you the picture, but I didn't see any. Anyway, this page is odd with the distancing. Like, how are Izuku's group able to see the Nomu from so far away? And why does it look like there's a tube in the background there? Like, what are the relative distances? Um, and also, like, why turn it into a comedy moment with the shocked faces? Comedy during a battle with brutal killers that can end a regular hero like it's nothing? Like, that's reserved for people who are strong. And, like, I, I get it. The Nomus are, like, really weird designs. And I laugh, too, especially at this one right here. But the panel, I, I felt like it was a weird choice. It might just be the way that I'm seeing it. Like, I'm seeing it as a joke panel. But, yeah, it, like, for me, it seems like a moment. It seems like a jarring moment of levity. You could just argue that the author was just trying to insert some humor, like just like, oh man, look at these guys, they're so ugly kind of thing, right? Like maybe he was trying to do that, but it's like, this is more of a grotesque horror as opposed to a grotesque comedy kind of thing, you know? Uh, I would love to know if how you guys interpreted that particular panel though. Anyway, we go to page 14 and 15. We have Shigaraki pulling off the pose. Uh, he looks good. Fun fact, it took me a while to figure out what exactly was going on with Shigaraki's arm. I thought he lost it, but yeah, it's it's, it's a funny visual. Um, at this point, I want to say that Shigaraki looks like he's focusing on the fight. And interestingly, we haven't seen the voice in his head. So my question is, is the voice gone because Aizawa is erasing the quirk or because the voice decided to quiet down? If it's the case that Aizawa is getting involved, it's kind of interesting to think that vestiges could be muted in that manner. Anyway, um, that page Shigaraki just telling us that the, his decay control is more fine-tuned and I can really appreciate that. Uh, page 15, it's mostly an explanation of how Shigaraki knew what to do and how he woke uh, the Nomu up, so fair enough, I guess. Uh, the big thing is that the page sets up that they're not as dangerous as the high ends, but more dangerous than the first Nomu that we ever saw. Uh, page 16, we get the near high end name and we see something getting skewered. Like, it, it looks pretty brutal. Uh, anyway, Gran Torino tells the duo to stay behind. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, page 17, you have the spare heroes coming in. You have Rock Lock jumping in front of Shigaraki. 100% respect that. And yeah, you know, like 17 is just one of those pages that when you look at it in spoilers, it just makes you think like, shit, 
Aizawa is going to die. Like, man, Aizawa, seriously, don't put out future expectations. Don't say that you want to be there for those kids to graduate. It's just terrifying. But yeah, man, in terms of drama and tension, those two pages together were really, really good. Uh, page 18, the big thing that people talked about is that Aizawa was thinking about Shinzo. So I hope that's a soft confirmation that he's going to be in 1A. But, you know, overall, it's still a cute shot of all his students. That's That was pretty nice. Um, now, I got a really small note on geometry. Like, I would really like to know... What happened for Gran Torino to somehow come behind Aizawa, but Izuku and Bakugo to come in from the side? It's just kind of funny. Again, though, like, you know, that's just a funny, like, joke. It's honestly just the chaos of the battlefield. And honestly, this just, it looks better this way. This is just probably the needs of the story overcoming the logic of the story. I, I, the good thing about it is that you can make it work. You just have to say, oh, like... Izuku and Bakugo just turned all of a sudden and then just turned back towards Shigaraki. There's tons of ways to explain it. Uh, but yeah, uh, moving away from the visuals, I like that the boys came in and we got to see Izuku sparking again. And actually on that point, knowing that he Izuku is hitting 45% at the moment of impact, it's likely that Izuku is slipping past 45 given that we've seen Izuku slip by his arbitrary percentages before. Um, in critical moments, so that wouldn't be too surprising. Anyway, going back to the boys, um, I do think it was really neat to see Izuku thinking about all the times that Aizawa saved him, and I, I like Bakugo thinking about the time that Aizawa got in trouble for the kidnapping and him having to apologize for it, which builds onto what I, uh, Bakugo is more concentrated on, that being the things that he sees that he caused. Uh, it would probably be the best way to describe that. Anyway, I'm really hoping that in the next chapter we open up with... Izuku restraining Shigaraki and Bakugo coming over Izuku's head to blast Shigaraki in the face. Because that would be so cool. Uh, that would be like 100% cool. But that's the end of the chapter. Um, oof, my, my voice is dying. Uh, but in terms of what we ultimately get here and where we're going in the future, you know, I, I want to see just a, a fun choreography. Uh, we just got a high here, so we need to see a little bit of a low maybe. I can tell you I am... Definitely 100% terrified for whenever Giganto Machia shows up. Just because, you know, when he shows up, it's going to cause a turn in the fight. Um, either into conclusion or into, like, horrible despair. Um, and when he shows up, it might also be the moment where we go back to the other uh, group to see what they were doing. And, you know, I really don't want to leave this fight because this one is so good. But... It is beyond reasonable to have Giganto Machia, uh, sorry, Machia show up and then go to the other group as a flashback in the subsequent chapter just to show us how it ended up with Giganto Machia there. Uh, so, you know, once that comes, it'll be interesting. Now, I am still kind of hoping for a chapter 278 Dobby identity reveal. That's looking very unlikely. For anyone who doesn't know why 278, it's because I, I saw a funny post on Reddit and it'd just be really cool if the post was right with the prediction. Um, but I, I, I actually think it would be very reasonable to end the fight at chapter 279, but we are so close now. 277, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm very interested about what's going to happen in 277, 278. Um, I, some part of the chapter, like especially when it comes to the way the distancing was done, especially with the normal introduction scene, it feels sort of like the author is rushing, but he has no need to rush. Um, I think everyone's enjoying the manga. Um, so it might just be that he has so much he wants to do kind of thing. Or maybe he's just getting really good at optimizing what things, like maybe he's getting good at figuring out what things he can cut out and what, what things he can kind of rush to make sure that the manga maintains a good pace. But yeah, uh, it's going to be a fun one. I can't wait for next week. I'm very excited. Guys, let me know what you thought down below. Until next time, I hope you have an absolutely great day.